Okay, hello everyone, and welcome to the uh, the third session of the uh, the third talk of the day. Um, we have uh, Franz Scheer from um, from the doing a PhD in the group of uh, Wolfgang Mass, and uh, and he's going to be talking about more biologically inspired learning for us. Great, Franz, can you take it away? Yeah, so uh, thanks for the introduction, and also thanks for the invitation. Of course, uh, I'm happy to be here and uh, to have the opportunity to discuss this with uh, such a great uh, uh, crowd. Yeah, and uh, like I said, so in the next uh, half an hour, I will uh, talk about the biologically inspired learning algorithm for recurrent networks of spike neurons, which we call EPROC. And so uh, the work that I present here um, uh, is uh, actually collaborative effort of uh, the people that you see here listed below. And so this research was led by Wolfgang Maas. All right, so I have divided this talk into some parts, where we'll first start out with some background information. Afterwards, we will quickly dive into uh, the algorithm itself. Then I will discuss also an extension to it. And uh, eventually I will uh, try to conclude uh, the talk uh, with a short summary. All right. So why would they actually want to study recurrent networks of spiking neurons? Because uh, they're uh, sometimes referred to as uh, being uh, notoriously hard to train. And so one motivation, of course, is that the brain employs um, spiking neurons as its uh, computational substrate, so to say. And uh, these networks are actually highly recurrent also. And so if we understand better uh, the learning uh, procedures in, in uh, spiking neurons, in recurrent ones, uh, we actually gain also a better understanding uh, how, of how the brain works. And so the obvious question is, why did actually nature decide to use such uh, recurrent networks? And uh, of course, it uh, must have uh, some reason uh, for this decision. And there are some uh, obvious advantages to this uh, kind of architecture. So first of all, uh, recurrent networks uh, are really good uh, in tasks that uh, have like a strong temporal component. So for example, humans are experience, experience a lot of uh, sensor, sensory uh, sensations uh, through time and they have like to have to piece together all these different uh, kinds of evidence in order to come up with a more uh, accurate uh, description or belief of uh, the environment that they act in. And so uh, what is also the case is that humans are very good uh, at uh, making decisions very fast if they are required very fast. So imagine an emergency scenario. A human can uh, quickly decide what uh, uh, should be done, right? But um, as more compute time is allocated to this uh, kind of decision problem, uh, humans can also refine the decision and uh, 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 think of it in many different uh, kind of aspects. And so such an iterative kind of uh, scheme fits very naturally uh, with uh, recurrent neural networks. All right. And so also, if you consider a machine learning perspective, uh, in order to get uh, more performance uh, in some, some kind of tasks, one often uh, kind of uh, increases the model size, stacking more and more layers. And so uh, with recurrent networks, you can consider like each computational time step as one such a layer. And so therefore it has already been shown that you can uh, achieve a similar accuracy with a recurrent network, uh, despite having a, a much smaller network actually. And so for all of these reasons, recurrent networks are actually also a very attractive choice for future implementations of, uh, of uh, kind of uh, uh, neural networks in hardware. So neuromorphic hardware is the field in which this is interesting. All right. And so some of these uh, kind of advantages were also picked up uh, by, by machine learning and have led over there to uh, kind of uh, very impressive results. And so the, uh, one of the uh, famous architectures uh, that are recurrent uh, are the so-called LSTM networks, uh, which have like an additional memory uh, cell content which enables these networks to further accumulate evidence from past from past timestamps. And so, of course, uh, 
an architecture is just half the rent. Someone also needs a, like a, a training or optimization uh, kind of algorithm, uh, a learning algorithm, which actually uh, can install and make use, uh, uh, make use of this recurrent architecture and install some function. And so in machine learning, uh, this is quite uh, every time uh, uh, a gradient-based learning method, uh, in particular backpropagation for time. And so these kind of uh, items, uh, some kind of recurrent architecture, plus the training uh, method, backpropagation for time, uh, have resulted in uh, many impressive results. But you can still say uh, that brains are quite uh, superior still to all what we have seen because they're really learning machines, uh, in fact, and um, they do employ recurrent networks of spiking neurons. And also, it's quite impossible that uh, backpropagation for time is actually used as a learning algorithm uh, in these networks or in the brain more specifically. And so therefore, uh, we consider uh, biological plausible replacements for these two items. So instead of LSTM networks, uh, in all of the results that I'm going to show you, we will uh, be using uh, Ellison ends, which on, on which I will elaborate uh, later. And instead of backpropagation for time, we will use EPROP. All right. So uh, let me shortly clarify what Ellison ends uh, actually are. So uh, Ellison ends are simply recurrent networks uh, of spiking neurons where some of the neurons have uh, exhibit spike frequency adaptation. So Sander had already uh, talked about this earlier. And so the basic uh, principle of this spike frequency adaptation is uh, that a neuron uh, adapts its uh, spike output in response to a constant stimulus. And so this amounts to a slower internal process, like an adaptive threshold. And it has been shown uh, by, by Guillaume Bellec that um, this helps uh, gradient-based uh, learning methods uh, to achieve a performance uh, that is similar to uh, LSTM networks in really difficult tasks. All right, and so a few words uh, to backpropagation for time also. So it, it is widely known that um, backpropagation can be used to minimize a loss function uh, with respect to the parameters of a neural network uh, by gradient descent, uh, because gradients are what is what is being computed with backprop. And so backpropagation for time is simply the extension to recurrent networks. And so let me uh, shortly tell you how this works. So backpropagation for time uh, simply uh, uh, makes uh, this kind of uh, virtual unrolling of the computation in such a recurrent network, where you kind of uh, uh, consider that each computation time step uh, is represented by a virtual copy of, uh, of this recurrent network. And the outputs that are produced by this, uh, by this network uh, at one time step are being sent to the virtual copy of uh, the network at the next time step. And so after some time of uh, computation, uh, you're actually then able to evaluate the loss function E, which you would like to improve. And so for that, uh, you simply then apply backprop to this virtually unrolled neural network. And so here comes the problem with this uh, kind of algorithm. Uh, it requires that uh, all uh, intermediate uh, states that correspond to the different times within the computation have to be stored, because then when uh, the loss function is evaluated, uh, you need to uh, propagate the gradients starting from the last computation time step backwards through time. And so this uh, makes it uh, highly implausible that the brain could actually implement such an algorithm for learning. And so we considered this problem uh, and tried to uh, overcome this somehow. And so what came out of these efforts uh, is EPRO, which was recently uh, published in Nature Communications. And so uh, the basic idea of EPRO is to use uh, some uh, biological inspiration or more particularly observations uh, that, have, that one uh, has seen in the brain. So the first uh, key element is that synapses uh, obviously maintain like a fading memory of uh, recent activity that is local to the synapse. 
which are often called also eligibility traces. And so then, uh, the second kind of observation is that there exists a lot of uh, so-called top-down learning signals in the brain, which can take on various different forms. Uh, very popular, of course, uh, neuromodulators. And these can cause a uh, large synaptic plasticity uh, or large changes in uh, the synaptic weights if they were, for example, preceded um, by, uh, by synaptic activity, which further implies the existence of such eligibility traces. <clears throat> All right, and so we take uh, these two ingredients and our goal is, uh, like before, to minimize a loss function uh, by applying synaptic plasticity. But uh, instead of this cumbersome offline processing that uh, is required with backpropagation for time, we want to have like an uh, online rule that would be plausible also uh, would also be possible to be implemented by the brain. And so uh, we can write this down uh, in that we uh, uh, adapt the weights in the direction of this product, where one component uh, should represent the eligibility trace. And so this should be specific for each synapse and also independent of the loss function because it just uh, should trace uh, like recent activity local to the synapse. And then on the other hand, we have a top-down learning signal, uh, which should uh, transmit um, like the task relevant uh, information, whatever that may be, we will see later. Right. And so this is uh, specific to the postsynaptic neuron. So it's much more fine-grained than like a scalar reward signal, let's say. All right. And so uh, we want to connect this, of course, to gradient-based learning. And so this means uh, if we actually apply this learning rule with a small, uh, small enough learning rate, that would correspond effectively to gradient descent uh, if the gradient uh, of the loss with respect to the synaptic weights are given just by the sum of these uh, products in time. And so now I'm going to show you uh, if we uh, carry out the math, what mean actually uh, comes to be uh, for the learning signals and the eligibility traces. So what is the form, uh, the mathematical form that they assume? And for that, we start with the computational graph, where we have represented each computational time step. And uh, we say uh, the hidden state, uh, there exists a hidden state of a neuron, which summarizes uh, the current state of the membrane voltage, maybe also the current state of uh, spike frequency adaptation, and all kinds of other uh, internal processes that uh, describe the behavior of the neuron. And so with that, uh, we uh, denote the output of such a neuron, which in a spike neuron is just a spike. All right. And so uh, if we apply back propagation for time, uh, we would um, start, of course, at the end of the computation and propagate uh, backwards in time uh, uh, these gradients, which is uh, uh, the derivative of the loss with respect to the hidden state at every time step. And so our strategy will be to kind of uh, separate out uh, the internal processes of the neuron, which we can achieve if we apply the chain rule uh, at the nodes uh, of the hidden states at each time step. <clears throat> so if we do this here, for example, we end up with this uh, slightly expanded um, uh, expression. Um, which here uh, includes the derivative uh, of the loss with respect to the hidden state at the next time step. And so we can perform this iteratively. Uh, and after uh, some uh, manipulation uh, of the expanded um, expression that we get there, we basically end up uh, with this at first complicated um, looking expression. But here already we can uh, read off uh, what meaning uh, we can attribute to the learning signal and to the eligibility traces. So here, of course, it makes sense uh, to say, okay, the learning signal should now be this derivative, which uh, actually just tells us how the loss function would change if we change the output of the neuron at that time step, which kind of uh, makes is sensible for, for the term of a learning signal. And then on the other hand, we have the eligibility trace. And this should now be represented uh, 
by the rest of this expression. And so as you can see, uh, what the eligibility trace does uh, is it tracks how the synapse affects the hidden states uh, of that postsynaptic neuron. And uh, this kind of uh, tag is propagated forward in time according to the dynamics of the postsynaptic neuron. So we can write down uh, like a recursive expression for the computation of this eligibility trace. And we can compute this alongside network computation, independent of how long, uh, how many computational time steps there are. All right. And so far, uh, we have just uh, reformulated uh, the gradients uh, of a recurrent neural network, right? So this uh, representation still yields the same uh, gradient that we would also obtain with uh, backpropagation for time. But we have uh, separated out uh, the neuron specific dynamics and uh, summarize them as such an eligibility trace. Okay. And so now let me remind you uh, our initial goal was to have uh, a learning algorithm that can uh, work just alongside the network computation. And so obviously, this learning signal that I mentioned before uh, is actually not available at the time step at which it is required because uh, the output of a neuron can also affect like uh, future hidden states of other neurons. Uh, and therefore, we uh, cannot know this at the time step t. And so at this point, uh, we say, all right, uh, but we have uh, like uh, accumulated a lot of information already in the eligibility traces. And at this point, we uh, kind of uh, afford to have an approximation. So we say, uh, we uh, just work with what is available at the current time step. And so this would amount to um, uh, broadcasts of instantaneously arising losses. So how does the neural output uh, immediately affect this loss function. And that means also that we, uh, by taking this approximation, we deviate from uh, like the true gradients that we would also obtain with backpropagation for time. But now we can perform online learning. Okay, and so now let me demonstrate to you uh, that uh, we, can, we are still able to perform a non-trivial credit assignment, non-trivial temporal credit assignment, and I show this to you on the basis of the following diagnostic task. So here in this task, the network receives uh, uh, Q inputs uh, in the left and at the right side. And after a delay, uh, the network has to uh, uh, report on which side there were more Qs. And so because of this, uh, a non-zero learning signal, meaning a broadcast of an instantaneous loss, is only defined during such during this decision period. And therefore also synaptic plasticity can only happen during this decision period. But the difficult thing is uh, the plasticity that uh, is applied at this point in time has to affect the computation that happened long before, uh, in particular, the integration of uh, these queues. And so the way how this works is uh, the input um, Kind of causes activity in the spiking network, uh, and this activity in turn causes uh, eligibility traces. And so, as you can see, uh, uh, I mean, we have to apply to uh, we have used here uh, uh, normal leaf neurons, and for such leaf neurons, begin to get fire neurons, the eligibility traces decay very quickly. But we also employed uh, in these LSNNs uh, neurons with slower internal processes, such as spike frequency adaptation, which then result in much longer lasting eligibility traces that actually extend uh, into this decision period. And therefore combined with the learning signals can cause synaptic plasticity, which eventually uh, uh, enabled the network to learn this task. And so we also applied the uh, this uh, learning rule to non-trivial uh, tasks or non-toy tasks maybe, uh, but also to tasks that are considered in machine learning as well. So for example, the recognition of uh, spoken phonemes uh, in the timid data set. And so over there, we use the same uh, recurrent uh, network architecture being LSNNs, and we trained uh, a number of networks either with backpropagation 
or with EEPROM. And so what we obtained here is that the performance of the networks that we trained with EPRO was actually pretty close to the networks uh, uh, that were trained with backpropagation for time. And so this uh, uh, is really uh, cool in this, in, in this forward sense, because uh, EPRO, of course, uh, can be performed uh, online, just alongside network computation, which backpropagation for time cannot. And so one remark that I would like to point out here is um, the recurrent connections do really matter a lot in this task because you also train feed forward networks on this task that were much larger. But performance wise, they were no match for the recurrent networks. All right. And so um, uh, these kind of uh, gradient based um, learning methods they have this great flexibility in uh, specifying what the loss function should be, right? So we cannot only consider supervised learning, but we can also use uh, loss functions that are used or employed uh, in deep reinforcement learning. So policy gradient with act to critic, let's say. And so uh, this actually resulted in a learning algorithm uh, that we call reward based EEPROM. And that allows uh, networks uh, to learn just uh, from rewards. And so we tested this uh, uh, on the benchmark of uh, Atari games, here in particular, the game of Palm, where a spiking network received uh, the current uh, frame of the game screen as an input, so very high dimensional observation, and then has to decide uh, on uh, which action to take in order to beat the opponent. So in this case here, the network controls the the green panel, the green panel, uh, and then it successfully outplays the opponent, despite only receiving uh, reward signals without any further teacher, which further demonstrates how versatile uh, these approaches are. All right, so now I come already to uh, uh, to uh, an extension uh, to EPRO, which uh, specifically tries to address the learning speed of EPRO. So as you might recall, uh, I've said um, uh, this ideal learning signal, which would um, uh, actually make um, the gradients uh, equivalent to those uh, that, were that would be obtained with backpropagation for time, they are not available at the current time step. And so therefore, we had to use uh, some approximation of it, uh, like an instantaneous broadcast. But um, in the view of bi biology, uh, did, that seems to be rather talk, right? Because uh, it is actually the case that learning signals are generated within the brain itself. And so one uh, could argue that um, uh, the generation, the distribution of such learning signals uh, was quite a bit optimized uh, through evolutionary processes, let's say, in order to support fast learning of survival relevant tasks. And so one uh, region uh, which you could identify as uh, distributing uh, specialized learning signals is the area of VTA, because uh, it was recently shown that uh, it not only uh, kind of uh, transmits um, scalar reward prediction error, rather uh, there is uh, uh, much task relevant information also contained in this signal. And uh, this arrives at different populations of neurons as well. And so uh, we kind of further take this inspiration and uh, we model this uh, kind of uh, with our own artificial VTA, let's say. And so uh, 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 what is promising about this approach is, since uh, this uh, learning signal generator, as we call it, has its own computational facilities, it could possibly come up with much better learning signals that are really tailor-made for the kind of problems that are likely to be encountered. And so uh, we still uh, use EPROP in, for the connections that are shown here in red, uh, with uh, the eligibility traces just as before. But now the learning signals are not uh, random broadcasts, rather they are being sent from this learning signal generator. Okay, and so now uh, we wanted to evaluate um, this uh, learning architecture on how fast it can actually learn, uh, learn something. And so for this purpose, uh, we use the Omnigyot dataset, 
which actually consists of uh, many different handwritten characters from many different alphabets. And so each character represents a different category. We can see uh, some uh, samples of different categories here. And in addition, uh, there is also significant variation uh, within each category because you can draw uh, each character differently. So it's a standard data set in meta learning actually. And so now let me tell you uh, how we constructed the task uh, in order to, uh, uh, to evaluate this learning approach. So we were particularly interested in one-shot learning, meaning that um, the network should be able to learn uh, uh, to classify uh, and, or to learn uh, what is a category, right? Just by seeing one sample of such a category. And so for this purpose, uh, we came up with the following task structure, where in a phase one, the network is shown a sample from the target category, and then it proceeds into a second phase, where it is shown a sequence of uh, different samples from different um, uh, categories, and then it has to report uh, uh, at which point a sample from the, from the target category was present. And so in this case, uh, it was the third um, uh, sample in the second phase, and the network has to report at this point in time um, that, this is the, that this is like the sample from the, from the target category. So if it reports uh, at a different point in time that uh, uh, it's, it's, it's a sample from the target category, it would be counted as, as an error. And so let me uh, also lose a few words about the concrete architecture that we used uh, for this task. So like I said, we, had, uh, we have uh, two networks. We have this learning signal generator, and we also have uh, this learning network, which applies synaptic plasticity. And then for this task, because we're working with uh, uh, image kind of input, uh, we also use a CNN, but it consists of uh, rather simple uh, McCulloch pitz neurons, which are just threshold gates. And so concretely, uh, when a network uh, uh, learns uh, a new category, uh, uh, it actually applies uh, uh, this learning rule with a natural EPROP in this first phase. So it applies EEPROM, but the learning signals come from the learning signal generator. And then we've now changed weights. Uh, the network goes into phase two, has to perform the task. But in this phase two, we inhibit the learning signal generator such that no plasticity takes place anymore. And so at this point, uh, you might kind of wonder uh, who does actually optimize uh, the weights in this learning signal generator? Or how uh, does actually the learning signal generator know what is a good um, learning signal, right? That um, supports fast learning. And so uh, to address this, we introduce uh, another kind of learning process that acts on a much slower time scale across many different such one-shot learning tasks, which could correspond to evolutionary processes. And so we use here uh, backpropagation for time uh, to optimize uh, the weights of the learning signal generator and also the initial weights of the learning network. But for if we then evaluate um, the learning performance, uh, we turn off this um, slow uh, learning process uh, such that there are, uh, such that no effects can uh, such that no learning performance uh, is actually uh, uh, implemented by backpropagation for time afterwards. All right. And so we carried out our tests and we found uh, uh, the human performance uh, is likely around uh, 85% based on uh, uh, informal testing uh, just uh, in our group. And uh, the results that we achieved with this uh, learning setup was actually pretty close uh, to this performance. And so like I said, uh, we did um, evaluate this without backpropagation for time happening in a slower time scale anymore. And we uh, evaluated the learning performance on uh, categories that the network has never seen before. And so uh, as a comparison, we also trained uh, like a normal network uh, to do the same kind of one-shot learning, 
just by uh, remembering uh, kind of features in its internal state, and uh, it resulted in inferior performance. And so here's an example uh, of the network uh, learning uh, in a new task, where we have in the first phase uh, learning signals being generated by the learning uh, by the learning signal generator, which are then transmitted to the learning network and then cause synaptic plasticity. And this uh, results then in the network to correctly uh, report when a sample of the same category is shown in phase two. All right. And so there are also additional kind of uh, fast learning tasks that we uh, uh, could achieve uh, with, uh, with this uh, kind of concept of natural EPRA. For example, we showed uh, that it is possible to do one-shot learning of new R movements and also fast learning of posterior probabilities. But I won't go into detail for these uh, kind of tasks. But I want to uh, uh, conclude uh, the presentation and uh, uh, summarize quickly what we have been talking about so far. So first of all, we have seen that we can uh, uh, modify uh, uh, kind of the gradient uh, representation or the way how backpropagation for time computes gradients and factor out the um, uh, internal processes within the neuron, such that we obtain uh, such eligibility traces. And then we have seen that uh, even if we approximate the uh, kind of the learning signals, uh, uh, within this uh, uh, learning algorithm, such that it becomes an online learning algorithm, we can still match very closely the performance uh, to backpropagation for time in many different tasks that are also of interest in machine learning. Uh, for example, re uh, reinforcement learning. Um, right. And uh, we argue that um, EPROP uh, uh, with kind of online learning signals is really powerful indeed uh, if the if the neurons that are being used uh, exhibit some slow kind of internal dynamics such as spike frequency adaptation because they result in long lasting eligibility traces and so then uh, we also have seen uh, some extension to eprop where we use some um, kind of refined learning signals which are computed also by a recurrent network of spiking neurons and this gives rise to uh, very fast learning capabilities. So in fact, one-shot learning on some tasks, which we call natural EPRO. All right, and so this brings me already to the end of the presentation, uh, where I would like to thank you for attention and uh, I'm happy to answer your questions now. Great, thank you very much, friends. Um, you'll only hear the clapping from me, but you'll uh, you'll, you'll probably get some some clap emoji coming through on the uh, on the chat in a minute, which I don't know if you can see or not because uh, I think you're on a one screen setup. Um, cool. Okay, so there's been lots of uh, there's been lots of interesting discussions, um, lots of interesting questions posed, and we could probably spend hours speaking about them all. Um, I think we can uh, we can kick off with one that I asked right near the beginning, which was when you were talking about recurrent neural networks. It reminded me that there was a Twitter discussion the other day, and uh, Simon Cronbeth said that recurrent neural networks were just equivalent to feed-forward networks with weight sharing. Um, do you think that perspective is fair or not? Yeah, I mean, uh, uh, it depends on how you think of it, right? Uh, when you consider recurrent neural network, right, that uh, performs computation for some time, right, uh, it would, uh, with each computation time step, add another layer to this uh, feed-forward network, right? So if, uh, if, uh, if you want to represent the computation of a recurrent neural network uh, with a feed for a network that has weight sharing, maybe for a long amount of time, so let's say uh, a few seconds, uh, that would lead to like uh, thousands of uh, layers within this uh, feed for network. Cool, okay. So I think for the next question, uh, we have Friedemann on the screen to ask. Yes, hi. Hi, Franz. Thanks for the nice talk. So I was wondering, also when reading the papers, uh, like that you often have these two neuron types, the one with uh, the slow adaptation time scale and the ones without. And I, and I was wondering why. I, I always felt probably the ones with adaptation, just maybe with a different time scale or more of them would be fine. So I wondered whether you could comment on that. Right. I think this is a very good question. So in principle, of course, you could say, um, 
we now use just um, uh, neurons with spike threshold adaptation uh, and like um, tune this uh, with gradient descent and how much the impact of this is, right? Uh, but so we actually uh, did not do this, right? So we just said, um, okay, there is a number of um, uh, neurons that exhibit this spike frequency adaptation according to values uh, of, uh, of like the brain. So there is like 40% which have significant spike pressure adaptation. And so we just use this, but there is no reason uh, to uh, do it exactly in this way. And so I think um, uh, already Sander considered uh, to optimize uh, uh, yeah, the time constants and everything uh, uh, for such adapting neurons. Uh, I hope this answers the question. Oh, sorry, I, I, I muted Fried Friedman. Sorry, I muted you. Did you want to follow up on that, Friedman? Uh, no, I'm fine. I'm fine. Thanks for muting me. No, sorry, <laughs> I didn't switch quickly enough on my headphone to add a reverb, I guess. Um, no, thank, that answers the question. Thank you very much. Cool. Um, all right, so uh, the next question I'm going to ask is, um, so, this is a it's a bit of a it's a two part a long two part question so um it's from a user yigit i don't know if that's uh, what that is exactly uh so hi franz fantastic work with eprop i have two related questions first lif requires e trace per neuron whereas alif requires a trace per synapse what kind of tasks do require eprop to have e trace per synapse to perform well um, yeah, that's, uh, I think this is a good question. And so uh, uh, we kind of started out, of course, with, uh, with the idea that every synapse has uh, its own eligibility traits. And so it's, it's uh, just uh, uh, a mathematical uh, result that uh, in the neurons, um, uh, you can uh, represent this per neuron on a per neuron basis, right? And so uh, it turns out if uh, this postsynaptic uh, Dynamics. Uh, I mean, the, the dynamics of this postsynaptic neuron uh, include terms uh, that depend on the postsynaptic neuron, and the eligibility traces uh, really have to become uh, synapse-specific, right? Because in the diff kind of uh, case, uh, the postsynaptic dynamics is just this dk, right? Uh, according to the membrane time constant, and so therefore this is uh, more a special case that you can uh, use uh, eligibility traces uh, uh, per, per presynaptic neuron. I mean, it's a bit, little bit more difficult uh, uh, because you also have there this gating, right? Uh, this uh, voltage-dependent term on the postsynaptic side. And so therefore, uh, the E-trace itself is always kind of sound-specific, but the part that you propagate forward in time, that can be a uh, specific only on the per neuron basis. So I think it's more like the special case just in the lift case. But as the neuron model becomes more and more complicated, um, uh, you you will end up with uh, some specific traces. OK. There was a, there was a follow-up as well. The, the second part of the question was, uh, can you use uh, an LIF with a long uh, E-trace time constant uh, be computationally equiv equivalent to an ALIF neuron? Um, uh, so I assume uh, uh, if you have um, the time constant of the membrane voltage decay very long, uh, kind of uh, long, is this true or is this? Uh, that, that's, that's the, that was the question as asked. Uh, okay, so I think uh, uh, there may be a few answers to this question. Uh, and so the first thing is, um, uh, the time constant uh, with, with, with which the E-trace uh, decays depends uh, just on the dynamics of the postsynaptic neuron, right? So if you want to have long-lasting uh, eligibility traces, the neurons have to have uh, long, uh, long scale, uh, uh, like uh, really uh, dynamics that happens on a, on a slower time scale. And so for just the lift case, that would mean um, it would have to have uh, a membrane time constant that is very large. And so I'm not sure uh, if uh, that would like uh, uh, lead to uh, 
an uh, equivalent to these adapting neurons uh, because it kind of, kind of uh, hurts the performance. So if, if, if no neuron actually can forget any evidence, right? So this is, I think it's very useful if there are also components in the network that um, uh, don't have like this long, long memory. Okay. Right, but can, yeah, I think uh, maybe this is already the answer to this question. Yeah, yeah, I think so. Okay, so we have um, Matteo on screen now to ask his question. Uh, yeah, can you hear me? Yeah. Yes, I do. Okay, so uh, thank you very, very thank you for the nice talk. And uh, yeah, my question is more related to uh, the mathematical part of the EPROP. So has the eligibility traces actually the uh, convolution with the kernel of the member potential in the LA and the leaf case, the leaky integrated and fire case? So is at the end of the day the gradient part of the backpropagation through time? Uh, then I'm wondering, is EPROP then simply somehow the stochastic approximation of back propagation through time, as we people does in general with the uh, uh, stochastic gradient descent in the normal fit for one neural networks. As every time step, you receive a uh, approximated error signal that is from the approximated gradient, given the fact that you receive one only one uh, data point every time step, and then you accumulate this information. Um, yeah. So uh, the thing is. Uh, so I'm, I'm uh, trying to answer the, the first part of the question, right? uh, where you were talking about the convolution with this, uh, yeah, with the postsynaptic uh, exponential field. Mm -hmm. Right. I mean, so this uh, uh, simply arises because um, we have factored out the, the dynamics of the postsynaptic neuron, and the dynamics of the postsynaptic neuron is simply this uh, DK, right? Uh, yeah. Exponential DK. And so therefore the, uh, this part uh, is just uh, like the convolution with this uh, post-synaptic count, that is yeah. true, right? But um, uh, in the case that the neurons uh, become more and more complicated and have uh, more components uh, in its state, there is also interaction between uh, the components that represent um, the membrane voltage and other parts, right? And so the other part of the question, uh, so I'm not sure if I uh, understood correctly, uh, but um, yeah, maybe, maybe you can repeat it there shortly. No, uh, they're actually related. So they're somehow the same. So my question is, um, we know from normal back propagation that you can apply stochastic gradient descent. This uh, concept that comes from stochastic optimization, you, mm -hmm. instead of applying uh, and updating the, the weight at every time step with the whole gradient, you, you apply one, uh, you get one data point at, at the time and then you approximate the gradient. Mm -hmm. So my question is, is in, then in this perspective, EPROP, the uh, stochastic approximation of backpropagation for time? Because mathematically to me, at, as far as my, my understanding, they look pretty like exactly the same. So is applying stochastic gradient descent, but on backpropagation for time? Uh, no, I, I wouldn't uh, say so because um... Um, uh, the thing is, stochastic gradient descent that you point out is uh, when you have like a complete data set and uh, uh, you will just apply updates uh, with respect to some examples, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, so this is also the case with backpropagation for time when you consider just the computation of uh, of like uh, some sequences, right? And so, uh, so we start there. So in the case that we just represent this differently and use this ideal learning signal, we have the same gradients as back propagation for time. And yeah. so therefore we also do need uh, this kind of um, uh, stochastic uh, optimization also there. If we, um, like with a small learning rate, we process uh, examples uh, uh, at a time and uh, therefore it will end up with uh, stochastic gradient using. But there is this additional part, right? where we uh, approximate the learning signal because the ideal one is not uh, available but we send just the instantaneous broadcasts, right? And so there uh, we kind of uh, deviate from the true gradients and so therefore we cannot speak anymore from stochastic gradient descent maybe because it's like an approximation, right? And it's for sure biased. So it's it's like not an unbiased estimator of, of the gradient that we would have with back propagation for time. 
Okay, I see. I thought that the, um, the, the approximation they do at every time step is actually somehow as approximating the gradient, but yeah, I see the point. Okay. Yeah, uh, let's say it's uh, simplified, let me see now. Okay, cool. cool. Thank you very much. Okay, yeah. Unfortunately, I think we're going to have to, to wrap up there. There's still 12 questions left uh, unanswered. Uh, but uh, unfortunately, we've got to start the next session. Um, maybe people can either email you or uh, tweet to you or something like that. Is there any preferred way you'd like to people to get in touch if they want to still answer, ask more questions? I think email is probably the best. Yep. Okay. I mentioned your email is hopefully easy enough to find us by right. googling you. So. And so cool. All right. In, the in that case, um, thank you again, Franz. And uh, I think we're about to start the, the next session. Next, next session. So I will end the broadcast there. Thank you very much. Thanks.